<coughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. A little trouble getting here in this weather, uh, eastern seaboard weather uh, issues. Um, I, I'm told you interrupt, which is a good thing. And, and so if I say something you don't understand, or I say something which you want to contest, um, feel free to do so. Right? And we'll see. Uh, <coughs> when I run out of gas, I'll just stop. Right? So, um, so I, I'm going to give you a sort of survey talk, try to put this field in perspective for you. And at the end, if I have time, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing uh, in the lab now. And, uh, and so let's, let's just start with the definition. So circadian rhythms, the word circadian comes from Latin, circa dia, and it means about a day. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that the natural timekeepers in animals, humans, mice, flies, don't keep precise 24-hour time. They keep circa 24-hour time, about 24 hours. Could be 23.8, 24.3, 22.5, depends on the species. To some extent, depends on the individual. Um, but we're all, we, we are all very, very close together at 24 hours and 15 minutes, human beings. Um, <clears throat> and the, re the way we get to be exactly 24 hours, the way tomorrow gets to be identical to today and yesterday, is, is because that clock gets readjusted by light every day. And so we have a, a, a timekeeper that runs uh, a little bit slow, 24 hours and 15 minutes. And every day, sunlight in the morning comes up and resets the clock. And that's why every day is the same as the day before. Otherwise, of course, we would drift um, by 15 minutes every day. Um, that's entrainment. And, and the purpose of this is really anticipation. So the purpose of timing is to know what's going to happen. Uh, the early bird gets the worm, and the early worm avoids being eaten by the bird. And I think th the way I think about biology uh, is really uh, with with, uh, from three points of view, it's very simple. Find mates, find food, and avoid predators, right? Those, those are the uh, three, three big uh, driving forces. And there's a little bit of evidence <coughs> that there, there's, there's also uh, internal coherence. That is, that one of, the, one of the purposes of the clock is to keep stuff inside in order. Um, so for example, enzymatic reactions, which work well, under, under um, high oxygen conditions are often temporally separated from those under low oxygen tension. And since oxygen uh, tension changes a function of time of day, you can, you can segregate those steps temporally, and, the, and they'll work a little bit better uh, uh, under the appropriate circumstances. So I, I'm going to sort of work mammals and humans into this talk um, here and there, but uh, mostly there as opposed to here. And so <clears throat> just to put this entrainment um, concept on firm ground for you and, and to put it in, in the context that uh, everybody's familiar with, um, this is how light um, entrains our clocks. There's only one way in. We only have one way for uh, photons to get to our body. And that's through the eye, which you can think of as an outcropping of the brain. It's the only part of the brain which isn't covered by this opaque, um, this opaque uh, cask, uh, football helmet, that evolution has put around our brain. And, and there's a direct connector, <coughs> the retina hypothalamic tract, which goes to the region of the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN for short. And that is the way that light entrains the circadian rhythms. And the SCN is the most important sort of central pacemaker part of the mammalian brain, of the human brain. Right, so, so you know, uh, if, if, first of all, your, your eyelid is not, you know, perfectly opaque. But, but really, the, the light entrainment is, is, a, is a once a day. I, I think about it as a once a day phenomenon. So we're talking about 
morning light shifting the clock. When you wake up, you open your eyes, right? You, you uh, open the curtains. And if it's, uh, you know, like, uh, yes? No, no, you go ahead. Right, so this is a very, the, the answer is that's correct. But um, the, the blind story about blind, <laughs> so the first, the first pass answer to you is, is yes, blind people are, um, they're in constant jet lag. They're 15 minutes uh, shifted every day. They're, they're, um, they have a lot of trouble with adjusting sleep-wake cycle and getting up for school and work. But that has a big caveat to it, and, and it takes a 10-minute segue to answer. So, so hold that, and if you want to hear more about it, and you, and you should because it's super interesting, and if I'm still standing um, at the end, I will, I will uh, tell you that. Actually, I may be carried out, and I'll still talk, tell you while I'm being carried out. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so let's go back, and, and let, me, let me point out the fact that uh, <clears throat> the, the light-dark cycle is the original, what the Germans called Zeitgeber. It's the original environmental cue, temporal cue, that light, <laughs> that life uh, <clears throat> was exposed to when it arose on the planet three and a half billion years ago. So the fact of the matter is before the atmosphere had anything like its current gaseous constitution, before nutrition for living organisms was anything resembling anything like what it is today, <coughs> early life was exposed to this inexorable uh, uh, change in the light-dark cycle and in most of the planet uh, an accompanying temperature cycle, right, except for, uh, you know, um, the most temperate zones. And so the, the oldest known clock, the organism with the best characterized and oldest clock is cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria. And, and this organism is responsible for oxygenation of the atmosphere about two billion years ago. So this photosynthetic organism is pumping out oxygen, uh, consuming CO2, and over the course of, you guys know better than I do, over the course of a long period of time, uh, oxygen went from almost nothing to, to its, 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 its current percentage. And this, this allows me to segue and point out to you the fact that <coughs> there are really very different clocks in cyanobacteria in animals. And by animals, uh, and as you'll see, I'm going to lump together flies and mammals. Um, where the clocks are really very similar. And, and plants are sort of in between. There's a little bit of a debate about whether plants are really different from animals or not. But the main point is, since, uh, <coughs> since cyanobacterial clocks and animal clocks are so different, this means that this, this, this phenomenon, this timekeeper, has arisen multiple times in evolution. Any of you budding biologists want to take a guess at how I can make the strong statement that this is completely different from that. You know, I mean, uh, so so the so the idea is we we know we know the genes and proteins that make up this, and we know the genes and proteins that make up this, and and there is no relationship in the genomes of these organisms. They don't contain anything which resembles you know, the other constituents, right? So, so the idea is it must, have, it must have arisen really independently in proteins and genes and created a system that just doesn't exist in the other place, right? Because normally you always find some m molecular connector on the basis of sequence that tells you that, you know, we're all relatives based on our DNA sequence and that's, <coughs> that's the idea. And so this, this, using the word evolution here, allows me to segue and make a point for this is so that we can have a drink together, right? I'm going to make a somewhat inflammatory remark, and you can, <coughs> you can take me to school on it if you don't agree. So in my long career, um, I, I, one has, I've come across many physicists who have migrated into biology, and I think relatively few of them have made an impact. And I think the reason is because they can't wrap their head around the fact that evolution is what has really sculpted all biological processes. 
And by that I mean that, that everything is, is an unbelievably clunky Rube Goldberg device. It, you know, the, for those of you who are not <coughs> Americans, uh, the, the Brits use a different word for this. Do you remember what it is? For Rube Goldberg, they have a, so this is a, a sort of klutzy thing where something works and something else gets grafted on top and then something else on top of that. And so you have this unbelievably uh, bizarre superstructure and, and it works, but it's incredibly inelegant and inefficient. And, 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 and that's how it works. And the point is, it is no engineer or no theoretician, no physicist would design something like this. It is completely crazy. <coughs> and, and just to relate to young people here, right? So procreation, you know, how we, how we mate and create the next generation is the most bizarre thing, right? Who would have invented such a thing? Anyway, <coughs> so, <coughs> so the, po the point is I think the physicists have, 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 have fallen on this problem because they're looking for rationality and elegance and, you know, and, and it's not. It's, it's, you just, it has to be empirical. You can't think your way through this. It's the way I like to think the teenagers, how did you think that up? And you, you know, to what teenagers do. Anyway. Okay, so, <coughs> so with this, with this as, a, as, a, as a sort of principal backdrop, let me uh, quote from S Seymour ben Sidney Brenner, who's passed away very recently, this, this quote from him. And, and, it, and it is to uh, underscore the fact that new techniques, new methodologies really push science forward. And I think to a large extent, um, discoveries. And by discoveries, I mean things that you, you uh, stumble upon empirically that are unexpected. And, and I'm not a great, um, I'm not a great uh, advocate of ideas, um, or uh, by that I mean uh, hypothesis-driven research, which is the, uh, the, the current, a, a watchword, a zeitgeist of uh, NIH. In other words, uh, the, the most remarkable things are things that are unexpected. And then you say, hey, where did that come, where did that band come from? Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and then you have to work out how, how that happened. And, and those kind of ideas are, of course, terrific because they didn't come from thinking, they came from experimental observation and then you can work, work your way toward it. So this is uh, Sidney Brenner with a little bit of uh, uh, <coughs> push from me. Um, so th this is um, the assay an assay of uh, circadian biology. And um, what's depicted here, it's an old slide, probably 25 years old or something, um, that depicts a rodent who's in a running wheel. And these animals love to exercise and run in the running wheel. And you can see how old the slide is because there, there's some, you know, actigraph that's, that's, you know, chart going like this, which is, which is measuring the revolutions as a function of time. And, and when, you <coughs> when you plot that out um, in, in constant darkness, so in other words, the animals in continuous darkness, and this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm from Boston. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, you, 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 you can see that the period is less than 24 hours because every day starts and ends a little earlier than the day before. But if the animal is in a light-dark cycle, uh, so 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark, then it's bang on 24 hours because the animal's in training to the light-dark cycle. And you also notice this animal is nocturnal, as mice and rats are, <coughs> because it's running at night and it's sleeping or is relatively inactive um, during the daytime. And the reason I call this a discovery is because the fact that that animal is so regular and every Every example, every member of the species is almost indistinguishable, is, is virtually unprecedented in behavioral biology. Because if you guys were to have a few neuroscience lectures here, let's say about learning and memory, you can't do an assay on one individual <coughs> and get a, get a strong reproducible result. You have to assay 100 individuals, and then you average the data, and then it's really pretty good. But this one animal is perfect, and it's identical to the next animal, and the next animal, and the next, next animal. And this sort of raises the mantra of genetics, 
which is like real estate, real estate, real oh, God damn it. Location, location, location. Aging, aging is tough, let me tell you. So location, location, location. So phenotype, phenotype, phenotype. In other words, the, 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 uh, uh, another way to rephrase this mantra is it's your assay. If your assay is fantastic and each animal's the same, you're golden, right? So that's the... That's sort of the idea. And this, and this segues to <coughs> a paper that was published by Konopka and Benzer in 1971 in PNAS. Konopka was a student. Um, Benzer was a famous guy, died in 2008, um, a fly geneticist. And what they did is look for mutants of Drosophila melanogaster. And by that, I mean they fed the fruit flies mutagens, sort of classic uh, classic forward genetics paradigm in which you feed the animals mutagens to create mutants in the DNA and then you look in the offspring to try to find bizarre um, behavioral patterns. And they looked at the circadian rhythms and they found in the activity plots, and now if you can sort of squint and imagine these plots of the, of the individual flies are similar to the mouse <coughs> on the running wheel where the flies are active and then inactive and active and inactive and from such a activity plot and I should I should have made, I should have put a slide in here to show you how this is done the, the flies are in in uh, single flies are in tubes about this this long and there's some food at the bottom and there's a stopper in the top right and the fly can run back and forth on the tube and there's a beam light beam infrared light beam on one side and there's a photoreceptor on the other side and this is just a beam break device used for all kinds of animals to get locomotion and the flies are blind in the infrared so the light doesn't disturb them and, and you get an activity pattern and of course the flies are active and then they're inactive and they're active and they're inactive and so you can get a rhythm from that and it's 23.7 hours uh, and, and they screen many individuals and found weird ones that were w short period, 19 hours, long period, 29 hours, and some that had no rhythms at all. And so they, they did a genetic screen to look for, um, look for bizarre animals. <coughs> and this is arguably the most famous paper in behavioral genetics um, that was ever published. And uh, in the first decade after its publication, it had 10 citations. Uh, so completely ignored, and this for biologists, uh, perhaps for you guys too, is a is is a, a, a useful lesson for chasing short-term fame. Meaning, meaning, uh, you know, some papers get published in Nature and Science, and and disappear. You know, two years later, nobody knows anything about them, and others are in much more modest journals, but they have real staying power. So, so. Um, You've been exposed to some DNA stuff, but let me let me just uh, tr try and walk you through this point and uh, ask why why would you do genetics to uh, to get at what's the underlying mechanism of timekeeping? And the answer is there is no other way to get at it. Meaning you you ha you have these bizarre phenomenon of animals being active and inactive, and you don't even know if 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 there's some magic out there which is causing this to, uh, to occur. And actually, for a long time, because the rhythms are so similar to 24 hours, people assumed they were driven by the light-dark cycle. But they're not exactly 24, and they work in constant darkness. So that would seem to argue against some external force, gravity or God knows what, which is, is, uh, is doing this. And so uh, the, the, the genetics is an entree into the genes and from the, if you can clone the gene then, and then perhaps figure out uh, what's, what's, uh, what's uh, the underlying mechanism. And this is different from the way we normally think about genetics, which is whether you know, Arnie and I carry different alleles which predispose us to cancer or you know, to like blonde women or who knows what, right? So, uh, and, and, and the point of this, and this slide is often for other kinds of audiences, I, I'll make the point that even learning, you know, this is a nature-nurture conversation, you know, where rhythms are, are, are these uh, 
inborn? Are they, are they inherited? Or, or can you learn stuff? And even learning relies on, everything relies on genes and proteins. And so uh, g forward genetics um, is, is the way to go when you know absolutely nothing. Forward genetics being look for phenotypes and then try to localize the genes. And it's really the opposite of hypothesis-driven research. This is the ultimate fishing expedition, right? What can we find? Right? And so all of this led to uh, a, 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 a sort of simple view for animals, which, which turns out to be correct, and, um, and that the, uh, the foundation of circadian timekeeping is a feedback loop is a transcriptional feedback loop, right? So the, the, the idea is that there's a positive transcription factor, turns out to be a heterodimer. Um, these are orthologs. You guys know the word orthologs, um, orthologous proteins. So exact same proteins in flies and mammals. They just ha this one has a different name um, in the two organisms. Um, this is a heterodimer, two proteins form one functional unit, the same two proteins in flies and mammals. This means that those proteins were inherited from a common ancestor. So this system existed at least 550 million years ago in the ancestor of flies and mammals. And, and this positive transcription factor drives the transcription of its ne own negative regulators. So in, for just to, to uh, put a buzzword out there to catalyze a discussion afterwards, perhaps. Um, limit cycle oscillators have been, have been used to model circadian rhythms for a long time. And that's the way mathematicians and, and some um, circadian biologists think about um, timekeeping. That is, you have a limit cycle that takes 24 hours to go around. And this is the molecular conceptualization, if I can call it that, of, of, such, a, of such an oscillator. You, you synthesize these RNAs. The RNAs make the proteins. The proteins accumulate. There's a delay, which you need for an oscillator in order not to have everything come to steady state. So there's a delay in the function of these negative regulators. Eventually, those proteins get together. They go back into the nucleus. They interact directly with the positive transcription factor. They rip this thing off DNA transcription decreases, and the RNAs decay and the proteins decay. And when the protein levels have gotten low enough, the whole system starts over again. Everyone sort of got the, got the picture? That's the idea. And flies and mammals, and it takes 24 hours to go around the clock, you know, 23.8 if there's no light or something like that. <coughs> and uh, the, the uh, upshot of this is that these mRNAs, and others as well, as I'll try and elaborate on, they, they, they're characteristic. They're, uh, what's, what's simple to see is that these RNAs, their messenger RNAs, oscillate in circadian time. So if you simply isolate RNA as a function of time from the animal, and you look, you find these mRNAs go like this. Right? And that's, that, that's the characteristic signature of, of this phenomenon. Now, there are many mRNAs that do that, as I'll elaborate on. But it turned out these were among the first to ever be found. And because they also were genetically implicated in the timing process, that sort of set the stage for thinking about this as actually, uh, as actually the timekeeper. And so Right. So. So I have, a picture, I have a picture of that a little bit later. But suffice it to say that in the, in the animal, um, the, 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 there are synchronization features. Um, for example, hormones in us which circulate and which are, which are keeping all the various clocks in sync. Right? And I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that a little bit. But it, it's, a, it's a good question. The, the clocks are present in lots of cells and tissues. And, and you absolutely have to synchronize those things. Someone else had a question, no? OK, same question. OK. So, so this, is a, this is a molecular picture that, that just gives you a flavor for an experiment that is, uh, it, it, this result is implicit 
in what I described. This, this is uh, one of those two genes that's driven by the positive transcription factor. This is timeless gene. This is the beginning of the gene. The gene is transcribed this way. This is the regulatory sequence of the gene, the most important regulatory sequence, another one here. And, and this is, uh, this is uh, a, a, an experiment in which the positive transcription factor clock is assayed as a function of time of day, two hours after dawn, 6, 10, 14, 18, 22, six time points taken. And then the stuff ground up, and then the chromatin assayed. And then, and then one examines the presence of clock, the positive transcription factor, on the regulatory sequences which are driving the transcription of this stuff. And what you can see is that the positive transcription factor goes on chromatin, is maximum about the middle of the day, and then it goes off chromatin. So it's on chromatin, and then it comes off chromatin, goes on chromatin, and goes off chromatin. And, and if you look at the negative regulator, this is the partner of this the protein that this guy makes. And this is now a negative regulator. This is one of the two proteins which turns this off. And you'll notice it's joining the chromatin later than this is. <coughs> it's actually coming on here more or less coincident with when this is decreasing. A and this is actually polymerase II. This is indicative of transcription of the, of the gene. Right? So the point here is that the gene is being transcribed like this. It's being transcribed because the positive transcription factor is going on, coming off, going on, and coming off. And the negative regulator is actually joining the positive transcription factor after the peak and sucking it off. That's the, th that's the picture. And there's evidence for everything I've just said that would take me the rest of the hour <coughs> to go through. OK, so yeah. Sorry? Is the process dictated by nocturnal? No. So the, n nobody, um, <clears throat> if, if you look at this problem in a, in, a, in a system which is well defined and where there are nocturnal and diurnal examples, the temporal profile I just showed you is identical. And so that means that the switch is downstream of the central timekeeper. Right, so there's something, you know, there's between this central timekeeper and behavior is a whole bunch of stuff, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And so there must, somewhere must be a sign switch somewhere, and nobody, nobody actually knows where that is. Someone else had a question. Yes? So I'm going to talk about all cells, but this, th this particular experiment is from fly heads. But the experiment's been done from mammalian liver grind up liver, it's been done from portions of the brain, it's been done from various places, and um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more or less a uniform picture from wherever you look at. That's, that's, that's to underscore that this is a general property, very simple general property. Yeah? Sorry? Yeah. So, so if you screw around with if you screw around with with drugs that affect uh, uh, you know histone modification enzymes, you, you you'll affect this stuff, but it's 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 not a very um, it's not a very useful experiment because it affects all genes and everywhere, and you get an effect and you don't know what's direct and indirect and what's through other processes and so forth and so on, right? Um, this, this is just a very vague general picture that sort of underscores the, you know, the, 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 um, the outline, that I, that I tr the picture I tried to paint. Okay, so I, I don't want to leave you with the fact that this is all transcription, this is all gene expression. You learned about kinases, was it this morning or yesterday, right? So there's, there's, there are very important <coughs> post-translational modification events, kinases, phosphatases, et cetera which are very important for this process. So to put this a slightly different way, the, the transcription factors I just described, they themselves are, are the substrates for important kinases. And those kinases have major effects on the timing mechanism. Um, and, and you can show that there are mutants in the kinases which will impact 
the timing and you can, you, know, you can find out which, as you put it, which serines are impacted when. And the, and the details here, exactly how this all works, is not completely clear, as I'll point out in a moment. But suffice it to say that this is a collaboration between a transcriptional loop and a post-translational modifications, which together give rise to the circa 24-hour properties. Right? That's the, that's the picture. So <clears throat> in, the, in the interest of uh, seducing you into circadian biology, I'm, 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 I'm going to lay out a what I think are challenges. You know, why would anybody, I mean, my goodness, there's been a Nobel Prize awarded here for this. Why would anybody work in such a thing? <laughs> and, uh, and I want to point out to you the things that we do not know. Right? So as, as some of the questions have alluded to, we really don't know why uh, <clears throat> this is 23.8 hours. Why is it not 21? Why is it not 27? Why is it not 12? What, what really accounts for the timing? And, and uh, this is, uh, that question is almost identical to asking what are the rate limiting steps? Because you have to think about this as a, uh, you know, as a, as a biochemist would. And, and therefore, something is rate limiting. Uh, something is rate determining. And what is it that is rate determining and causing this to be 23.8 hours? And by the way, this doesn't have to be one. As you go around the circle, this doesn't have to be the same thing all the way around. As in the cell cycle, there can be a handoff from one, one particular subregion of the cycle to the next region of the cycle. <coughs> and, um, and do I have this here? Yes. And so um, this question of what are the rate limiting steps is, is, is touches on or is, um, it, it, it joins a completely different phenomenon that I'm just going to introduce to you without going into any detail. And it's the phenomenon of temperature compensation. And, and this is an antiquated term. I, I personally, it, it goes back a long ways and has historical roots. Uh, but <clears throat> way before I knew what circadian rhythms uh, are. But uh, a biochemist might call this temperature independence. And the fact of the matter is that if you take a fruit fly and you measure its circadian rhythm at 18 degrees or at 29 degrees, temperatures in which it's completely comfortable, there's no stress, it lives fine in both temperatures, 10 degrees C, roughly, um, there's absolutely no change in circadian timing. So in other words, the Q10 of the reaction, if we can think about this as an enzyme, is almost exactly 1.0, so 1.03, something very close to 1.0. And <clears throat> to make this even more remarkable, if we ask this question about a mammal, you're going to say to me, well, that's stupid because mammals control their body temperature. But we can take the tissue out of the animal, and we can put it in culture, and we can even dissociate the cells, and we can measure the circadian rhythms of single cells. You put a reporter gene in the cells to make it very easy <coughs> to assay in real time the ticking away of the individual cells. And you take that tissue culture experiment, and you put it at, <coughs> at 37 degrees and 27 degrees, and you get no change in circadian periodicity with time. And, and so this is unprecedented in physiology. If you take the cell cycle, something Arnie knows well, and, you, and you, you, you either do it in tissue culture or you take embryos or you do some experiment at different temperatures, the, the, another cycle, uh, <coughs> the, the cycle time is dramatically increased with temperature. And this is standard in biology because the Q10 of an enzyme is, is about <clears throat> is about 2, so the rate, the Vmax of an enzyme at, with 10 degrees C difference is about twice as fast as it is 10 degrees slower. And so everything in biology, until, of course, you denature the system, you know, you trash the biological material of a high temperature, goes faster. And this is uh, unprecedented and, and unknown how it works. Developing organisms and the adults. You already told us about adults so far. Um, and what about a stress like moon or something like that? 
Right, so, so there's, let's see. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I got it. I was, there, were, there was a third. So, so it depends on the animal. When in development does the clock appear? Um, in flies, it, it appears in first instar larvae. Embryos have no clocks. And then, and then the clocks, so they, they make a couple of the proteins, but they are not orchestrated to do this stuff. And then, and then in first instar larvae, you know, the flies go through larval stages and they molt and then they have pupae and then they have adult. And in the first instar larvae, there's, there's a few cells and those cells have clocks and those clocks are temperature invariant um, in, the, in, the, in the larvae as well. The, the, the experiment with mammals uh, that I told you about, putting the culture, putting the mammalian tissue in culture where there's no hypothalamus and no temperature control, I, I, think, I think argues quite strongly that it's intrinsic to the mechanism, that, that whatever is the timekeeper, it's, it's doing it um, in a temperature independent way. And I should say, by the way, this makes great heuristic value because if you're an insect and you're you know, outside in Princeton, New Jersey, and there's a cold front that comes in, it can easily get to be 10 degrees C colder in one night. And you don't want your timekeeping mechanism telling you when, when the, your predators are coming around the next morning to be totally screwed up by the temperature change. So it makes sense. You don't want to, you, you want your clock to still work well uh, with diff in different temperatures. But how it works, and, and my, my, my point here is in terms of you know, what's not solved, th these two are almost certainly related. Because of course, if the rate limiting step, if you knew what the rate limiting step was, you would predict that that rate limiting step is temperature insensitive. That's how these two come together. And we don't know either of them, right? And, and, and the point here is this requires biochemistry and structure almost, almost certainly. In other words, you need to be able to reconstruct the ticking in a test tube with a defined number of pure components, or you need to solve the structure of the very key kinase substrate complex so you can really ask the question at the interface where these two, two proteins are talking to each other, is there, is there, a, a, uh, is there a surface which, which would make sense from this point of view? You know, this is all about what's the rate limiting step. So this is all to sketch out the fact I think this is a very interesting problem and it's not, and it's not solved. So for a physicist interested in something biological that <coughs> is a challenge and I think important, I think it's a good thing to do. Okay. So second challenge, um, you know, leveraging, this is a completely different uh, dimension of the problem, Le leveraging the uh, uh, knowledge for human health, right? And, and these are, this is stuff where um, arguably, to some extent, and inarguably for other, other, uh, other features, uh, the, this is affected, these, these phenomena are affected by the clock. Um, uh, nobody, nobody's going to argue with me about jet lag, I bet you, because, you know, you get out of the plane in, in, uh, in Beijing and you've 12 hours change and you feel like shit for several days uh, and your GI tract doesn't work very well, which is an aspect of this nobody ever talks about because you're not supposed to ever talk about that sort of thing. Um, and, so, and so that's your clock readjusting. Um, and so, you know, that clearly is relevant to circadian rhythms and then this other stuff, a, a couple of them I'll talk about in some, in some detail. And so this is a, a circadian center, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, did you want to, I don't Right, so, so there's a, the, we can come back to this. I'll, I'll give you a short answer and then you may want to revisit this during beer hour or whatever you do. Um, the, the, uh, th there's a phenomenon that's called a range of entrainment. And if, if you own a 24 hour and 15 minute clock like we do, you can entrain to 23 hours and 22 hours or to 25 hours and 26 hours plus or minus two hours around your endogenous period. And so if put in a cycling environment, which is two hours off your endogenous period, you can lock on to that 
period. Now, once, once that environment is gone, you go right back to your 23.8, but you can lock on it. But if you put them in 21 and 26, is it whatever, three, three on either side, it won't work. So, so you can only entrain to a limited range around, and there's, there's good biological reason for that, but that's, that's the short answer to your question. What, what, you, what, you, what, you would, what you would see in a, in a very detailed, sophisticated view of the pattern is it'll, it'll go a couple of, a cycle or two to the, to the longer or shorter period, and then it will quit. And then it will, so it'll, it'll sort of try to follow, but it, but it can't um, more than a tiny little bit. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's immediate. It goes right back to its endogenous period. So the, the uh, sorry? So, so if, if, if the time scale is within the range of entrainment, it's immediate. It's immediate. Um, the, the, uh, so the, it, it's sort of interesting because if you do an experiment with rodents or flies, you put them in constant darkness. <laughs> but you can imagine the human researchers can't put uh, a human in constant darkness for two weeks to see, you know, to do some experiment. It's, it's unethical. So what they do is they put a human, uh, they put human volunteers in a 28-hour cycle. So the lights, you know, go on at 28-hour patterns and the food and all that stuff's in 28. And now all the parameters that you can measure, hormone rhythms and things, all are bang on 24 hours and 15 minutes. So in other words, you get the endogenous data from the organism by exposing them to an environment outside of the range of entrainment. And that's ethical, right? <laughs> I, I didn't make up the ethics rules. So that's, huh? Right, so, so this is, th do I, did I have this on here? Right, you see this? Right, so, so the reason this is so problematic is because for most people who are doing shift work, some piece of their lives uh, turns out to be back on the normal schedule because you have kids who are going to school or you have a spouse who's, so, so, so the fact of the matter is that this kind of shift, it, 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 the, the volunteers get quite a bit of money in the hospitals for being on a 28-hour schedule. They have to sleep in there, everything, because everything is that you know, Because if you mix the environments, it's really not good for you, because then your body's getting mixed signals, right? Uh, OK, so this, is, this, is, this, this uh, idea that clocks affect everything is, is more or less um, depicted here. And there's a literature. You take any of those words, and you PubMed the word with circadian, and you're going to come up with you know, a thousand references. And, you know, some of them are, a few of them are solid, and another, another bunch are maybe, and then a whole bunch of garbage. But the point is that there's really a literature in all this stuff. And some of it's, some of it's very important, I would argue, and very, so, so I'll say something about metabolism, I think. Oh, sorry, I need to tell you this first, right? Okay, so, so why <coughs> is there so much physiology? Why are so many different phenomena affected by circadian rhythms, right? And, and the answer is, is really simple. First of all, and I think who asked me the question about um, clocks? You did, right? Somebody oh, in this part of the room. Um, that this little feedback loop um, exists in a s effectively all of our cells and tissues. So the liver, I mean, where there has really been precise experiments done, liver, kidney, skin, muscle, heart, brain. So <coughs> this, this, this stuff is ticking away everywhere. And that's the SCN. It's also ticking away in the brain. You know, this, so <coughs> all this stuff is, is ticking away in all these places. And, and in every one of those tissues, there's a whole bunch of messenger RNAs which are under clock control. Because if you simply isolate liver mRNA as a function of time of day, 
you find about 2,000, about 10% of the liver transcriptome is going like this, right? It's, it's, it's oscillating. And if you add up, <coughs> if you add up the different mRNAs and all these different tissues that are undergoing circadian oscillation, you come up with uh, at least 70% of the genome. So in other words, of the 22 to whatever your 22 to 24,000 genes um, in the human body, at least 70% of them under clock control are oscillating in one tissue or other. And that's it. That's, I mean, how could, how could all of physiology not be affected if so much of the genome is under circadian control? So let me say a word about metabolism and diabetes because I think there's quite a bit of interesting progress made here. And, and, <coughs> and now I'm going to come back to this picture I showed you at the beginning where, where light hits the eye and there's the retina hypothalamic tract going to the hypothalamus and the SCN. And, and then the, the general view, um, which, you know, here up, which is uh, true and, and simple, is that the SCN then connects to all kinds of brain structures, the, uh, the HPA axis, most notably hypothal hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. The adrenal gland produces cortisol. Our cortisol levels um, are, are hugely circadian as a function of time of day, high in the day, low at night. And, and all of this keeps all these clocks in sync because the clocks have glucocorticoid receptors, they have storied receptors in them, the hormones bind there, they shift the clocks a little bit, and that's what keeps all this stuff in sync. Now, the fly in the ointment, if you'll forgive the expression, is, is that about 15 years ago, there was sort of a new phenomenon that was discovered, and it was that the big metabolic clocks, let's say the liver, something very important for metabolism, turned out to be entrained not just by light and not just by metabolism, <laughs> not just by light, not just by hormones, but turned out to be entrained by food. And this turns out to be food metabolites. And the experiment is dead simple. So the great thing about biology, I, actually I worked when I was an undergraduate, um, Clyde, I, I worked in the lab of a really famous physical chemist uh, who'd worked um, in, in the Fermi labs during the war, and then he was a physical chemist, and he transitioned at the age of 45 to biology. And, and he was really a talented, he was a talented mathematician as well as physical chemist and all this. And he, he'd had this epiphany. He said, you know, everything important in biology is qualitative. My, my math skills have done me absolutely no good because all the great discoveries turned out to be qualitative and simple. And so this, this kind of experiment here, um, you know, mice, mice are active at night, they sleep in the day, and they consume most of their food at night. Tiny little bit in the daytime, but mostly at night. So what happens if you feed them only in the daytime? So you present them with food only in the daytime, they don't have any food at night, so they're going to eat in the daytime. That's right, so the only place to get food. That totally shifts all of their clocks and their internal organs, totally. So all this stuff is the same, driven by the light-dark cycle, and the food has totally shifted everything internal. They, 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 this is not a particularly happy animal because they have what's called internal desynchronization, you know, where the brain is going at one time and the organs, uh, are liver, <coughs> internal organs are going at another. But the point is it illustrates the fact that, that food and the metabolites are entraining the internal organs directly, independent of all the stuff from the brain. Now, normally, the, 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 the superficial paradox is resolved by the fact that normally our brain also determines our feeding time or, or you know, habit, which all f has feedback loops. So the point is we're normally eating very regularly as the mouse are eating at night um, normally. And so everything's in sync. And so you can't tell who's cause and who's effect. And, exactly what's the proximal cause. So you have to do some simple experiment like this to, to uh, you know, segregate the causes. But the point here is that, uh, that this, this is an important aspect of, of metabolism, right? When you eat, right, that's the, that's the principle. And so this, 
ex this experiment was published about five years ago and has, ha and has had a major impact. An earlier one has had a major impact on the field. And it's very simple. Uh, I just sort of point out to you. And so this is all about time-restricted feeding. So, so the idea here is that if you uh, take mice and you feed them on a high-fat diet or uh, a normal-fat diet and, um, and you introduce one more variable when they get to eat. So th this, um, I don't remember actually exactly how this was done, but I think the idea is 12 hours, only 12 hours access, or perhaps it was eight hours access to food and, and 16 hours of no food. And, and um, it turns out that the mice consume exactly the same numbers of calories under the ad lib feeding, eat whenever you want, or time-restricted feeding. There's no difference in calorie consumption. Um, but uh, this is the ad-lib mice on a half mouse on a high-fat diet. And this is the time-restricted mouse on a high-fat diet. Right? So the, the moral of the story is it, it isn't just what you eat or how much you eat. It's also when you eat. And, and the rationalization for this <clears throat> is to think about the metabolic cycle that's going on in your digestive system. In other words, w we make enzymes, the liver's the, the best example, we make stuff in anticipation of food. Um, we, make, we make enzymes for um, digesting food, and, and we make very important detoxifying enzymes to take care of the poisons that are in food. Because, of course, all food is a mixture of noxious stuff and good stuff. And, and the liver's designed to deal with both of them. And the liver puts out that stuff actually in anticipation of, of the food arriving. That's the, that's the purpose of the clock, to time that. And so, um, it, so it, it turns out that enhancing, probably enhancing, the, the delivery or the relationship between the delivery of the food and the natural cycles that take place probably improves metabolism in a way which gives rise to a leaner mouse. And I, 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 you know, full disclosure, I've been doing this myself for about a year, a, a year and a half. I cheat on it for various reasons, but the point is that, uh, you know, eight hours, eight, eight hours of food and 15 to six, eight to nine and 15 to 16 hours of no food. Um, and I, you know, you, you, you consume fewer calories, so you never know exactly what's the purpose, what, what's due to what. But I, but I think it makes sense, and I'm convinced it does no harm. Um, so, so anyway, this has had a, this has had a big impact. On so <laughs> I knew someone was going get to in get into the weeds here. That's why I say I cheat. So you're, 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 the, the best way to do this is to skip dinner. Because, because you, you, you have a natural insulin um, uh, rise in the morning. And so you, your body is more or less designed to take, have breakfast when you get, you know. Nighttime is a natural fasting period when you're sleeping. And, and when you get up, you eat breakfast, and there's a boost in insulin and all that sort of. But this means not going home and having dinner with your family and a glass of wine and how was your day and all that kind of stuff. So, so I just reversed it to, in order to, I said, I cheat, I compromise. So this is no, nothing from, let's say, 7 at night to 1 p.m. the next day, right? That's the, that's the idea for me. And that's the compromise. I'm not, you know, the literature on this is all very vague. But I think the, I think the point is that the time-restricted feeding experiments in the rodents are, are quite convincing. And it's not just lack of calories. There's something about timing the intake. And, and, it's, and it's, had, it's had an impact on diabetics and stuff like that. You know, this is the general idea. Okay, sleep disorders. Um, this, <laughs> Arnie, Arnie mentioned this um, particular phenomenon. Uh, he didn't get it quite right, but it was close enough for jazz or, or, or close enough for government work, another, another uh, metaphor that we, we, uh, we old timers use. Uh, so so th these are some of the clock genes that were originally discovered in flies. We don't have to worry too much about what's in black and what's in red. The, the asterisks mean that they exist in mice as well as flies. 
but they're originally discovered in flies. And the, the four genes which are um, indicated by arrows have been, have, been, uh, have been found in human sleep syndrome families as the cause of either advanced sleep phase syndrome or delayed sleep phase syndrome. So these turn out to be um, three of the families were Mormon families in Utah. The Mormons have big families and they're, they really like genealogy, so they keep track of all their cousins and nephews and grandparents and great-grandparents. And, uh, and this is really great for tracking Mendelian uh, inheritance of Mendelian characteristics. And so three of these families were found. So for instance, uh, advanced sleep phase syndrome is somebody uh, <coughs> who can't stay awake past uh, 7 p.m. You know, and then, and then sleeps from 7 to 3, um, perfectly happy eight hours. So they're, 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 they're totally normal, except they're shifted by three or four hours, um, actually identical to the short period flies that we have. Um, and, and, uh, and of course, this only causes a problem because those same people have to get up for work or um, uh, give, help their kids with homework at night. Or, you know, so the, the point is it's a, it's a social issue living in, in, in the world. And they turn out to be due to point mutations in these genes. Right? And, so, and so this is a timing. This is a timing issue and connects to human sleep. And, and I'm, I'm going to segue a little bit to, um, to fly sleep here. A and I want to say that in the last sort of, yes? Yeah, so there's advanced sleep phase syndrome, which is early. And there's delayed sleep phase syndrome, which is uh, staying up till 3 or 4 in the morning and sleeping till noon. And, and there's genes both in that list. And, and you're, you're sort of comparing the correlation kind of the, the anecdotal evidence here of folks saying that they're, they're really uh, good for Yeah, so, so th they, uh, in, in this room, um, w w there are early chronotypes and there are late chronotypes. And this would be early birds and night owls, early risers and people who go to bed late. And, and all of that is natural. You put people in a sleep clinic and not everybody breeds true because there's all kinds of reasons why people go to bed late, which is not just internal physiology. You know, they, uh, you know they, their partner, their kids are keeping them up. They spend too much time on the screen, on uh, you know, the screen, the blue, the blue screen, which is very stimulating. But, but some fraction, you put them in a sleep lab and it's genuine, right? And so, and some of those um, have a genetic underpinning and only one of those is, turns out to be that. that. Delayed, delayed sleep phase syndrome appears to be more subject to environmental issues than advanced sleep, as you would, as you would imagine, because there are a few life stimuli that make us go to bed at seven at night, right? And lots of them that make us go to bed at two in the morning. So the, 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 this is a, a, a very active field of research, not, none of which I have anything to do with. But I, you know, I, I go to meetings and listen to people and know some of these people. It's, it's been very hard to deconvolute what, what is circadian and what is sleep deprivation. In other words, everyone in this room is, is one to two hour, uh, everyone, almost everyone. Is, is one to two hours sleep deprived every day. That is Western civilization. Everybody is getting a little too little sleep than what they should. And, and that has an effect on the clock um, because of light exposure and all that business. And that also has a direct effect from just not getting enough sleep. And it's very hard to know what, what is the uh, approximate cause for health issues you know, if any, you can do it with an animal. You can do these experiments very well because you can separate these these two phenomena. But in humans, it's tough. So, you know, I, if I understood your question correctly, I don't think there's a clean answer.
you know, so I think the gen I think the general um, the the general view is you can do those shifts. You can sleep at odd times, and you can if you do those shifts judiciously. So if you sleep for a good um, bout of many days or weeks in a row at a, at an altered schedule, you know, and the room is black and all that kind of stuff, and you do that well, you're okay, right? Because you can you know you can go across you can go across the oceans, and after the you know, a few days of misery, you're 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 back in sync. So there's not there's nothing poisonous about about having an altered schedule, but I think shifts shifts that are frequent are are, are not giving you a proper chance to you know adjust to a new situation. Um, you know, that's the short answer to a much longer. Uh, me? <laughs> you know that you'll get my bill. You get my bill later. Yeah. No, no, these are germline. Because, and the reason they, they're, they're germline, because they were found in these Mendelian. So this is, this is mom and dad and uncle and brother and sister. So when that kind of pattern arises, that's germline, right? That has to be. And, and that's how they were found. So it's heritable. Totally. 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 So, so it's, 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 it's um, these are in general semi-dominant. That is, if you have two alleles, it's worse than having one. And, and for one of them, for sure, it's recessive. And so, you know, it, it, it varies, right? In, in general, these are semi-dominant because the chance of getting the two recessives together is, 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 is pretty rare, right? Uh, and, and these are frequent enough that you can just, you can pick them up fairly easily. You know the answer to that question, don't you? These are humans, right? Well, no, no, these humans, it's uh, mice or flies. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> <laughs> I truly thought you were asking about humans. <laughs> the, 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 um, so, so the answer is they're almost all semi-dominant. You get an in-between, you get an in-between pattern, right? Um, and it, whether it's whether it's uh, two alleles in the same gene, uh, or you or you have two completely different genes that that are contributing different steps in the pathway. Would it be true? I mean, if, if you have an early and a late, and you get in the middle, uh, are they just normal? Or but with a fruit normal? fly, with a fruit, so it's ah, the devil is in the details, right? So <laughs> so they're normal with respect to circadian period. If you start looking in great detail at things, you're going to find some. Depending on how much you know about the particular genes and alleles, you, you can get characteristics of both. Because of course, just looking at the period does not describe everything, right? So, so um, I can't believe how long I've been talking here. Uh, okay, so so w w I'm, I'm going to quit in a minute, and I'm not even going to get to my lab and experiments, or maybe I'll just spend one slide. So, so let me say that uh, as a fly aficionado. In the last 15 years or so, we know that flies sleep, and they sleep essentially indistinguishably from humans. By that I mean that if you, the only thing we can't do with a fly that we can do with a human, and it's almost actually there with a fly, is to do a EEG. You know, so the gold standard for human sleep assay is, a, is, a, is an electroencephalogram. So you have wires here, and you're measuring brain waves. And, and you get slow wave sleep, and you get rapid eye movement sleep, and you get deep sleep, and so forth and so on, and you go through these cycles in the night. So you can't do that with flies because the brain is too small to do this stuff. But you can measure almost everything else, and, and everything um, is, is the same. You have a question, or are you just scratching? OK. So <laughs> stretching. Uh, so, so, so for example. Um, most interestingly, uh, the the and now we sort of we talk a little in a little more detail about sleep, is um, is the homeostatic regulation of sleep. So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> if if uh, everyone in this room, all of you young people, um, sleep one or two hours too little um, Sunday night through Thursday night, 
and then will tend to oversleep on Saturday morning and Sunday morning. And that is your body making up for lost sleep. And that is homeostatic. That is reflecting the homeostatic regulation of your uh, work week sleep loss and, and f reflecting sleep need, and you're making up for it on the weekend. So nobody understands. And flies do exactly the same thing. If you sleep deprive the fly, you shake it, or you can do this in more sophisticated ways, and you keep it awake, um, the fly will sleep longer in order to make up for lost sleep. Um, <clears throat> and so eff effects of aging on the flies are virtually identical to what we see in humans. So these, my, my colleagues here, I would wager, wake up at uh, often at 3, 4, 5 in the morning, which is a characteristic feature, early morning awakening, of, of, uh, of uh, I won't say elderly, senior, senior, uh, <laughs> senior humans. And the uh, aged fruit flies do exactly the same thing. They show sleep fragmentation predominantly in the morning. So, so to, for all intents and purposes, they, the, the flies are, as they have been for circadian biology and for lots of other things, will turn out to be a great model, are turning out to be a great model for sleep. And so um, this, this, Arnie said this, he didn't know what I was going to talk about, but you know, this is, I think, a third challenge uh, and, and, a, and a tremendous, if I can use the word pro prize or goal of neuroscience to understand why do we sleep. And, and, and I would bet a lot of money that the answer will be the same in flies and humans, just as circadian biology turned out to be essentially identical in flies and humans and lots of other, lots of other things, of course. And, and of course, the, the companion to this, this is, this is sort of the why and this is the how, right? Um, what's keeping track of sleep need? Um, what's, the, what's the biochemical entity? What's the cellular entity? Where, where's, this, where's this taking place? Who's, who's counting? Who has the, uh, you know, the counter um, that's keeping track of this? Okay. So, so uh, huh. let, 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 let me, I'm going to whip through this, right? So that flies, um, they have a sophisticated, there's all kinds of diseases. That are being looked at, you know, sleep, <laughs> sleep disorders, aging, drug addiction, neurodegeneration. They have a very sophisticated behavioral repertoire, um, motivation, aggression, all, all kinds of stuff that flies do, that that um, humans do, and that and that can be studied much more readily in the fly because um, it it has about uh, a million times fewer neurons. Than the, uh, than the human brain. So it does all this sophisticated stuff with about 100,000 uh, neurons. And uh, in about one to two years, uh, thanks to work at Genelia Research Campus, we'll have a complete wiring diagram of all the connections, um, all the synapses that connect these 100,000 neurons. Of course, much more complex than, than C. elegans, than the worm, but of course, a much more sophisticated behavioral repertoire than the, than the, than the worm as, as well as a, a toolkit, which is absolutely remarkable, none of which you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about. Sorry? It's, it's, it's a little bit debated. It's a little bit debated, but, it, but I think I would, I would say not, 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 um, not yet so clearly. Um, so. Um, when you when you get a negative result in biology, you know, unlike theoretical physics, you can't you can't prove that that um, you know that that negative is rigorous. It it it's, it's could be that you just haven't done quite the right experiment, because of course you need an assay and the output. You don't know why quite C. elegans might have a rhythm, and then what exactly do you measure? So that's one possibility. Could have lost it, um, you know, in the course of so. It's not the only organism, by the way, in that. Category. Um, so, um, I, I think what I'm going to do is is uh, is just tell you that um, what I'm interested in is is the so so the fly huh, um, the fly circadian system 
is, uh, is all contained in 75 neurons, 75 on each side of the brain, 150 neurons. And that is the equivalent of the 20,000 neurons um, of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this is the small region of the hypothalamus that I referred to previously. The optic tract goes in here and connects to these guys. And this, this function is, is in the fly is completely taken care of by 75 neurons, 75 neurons. And some of them, um, some specific subset are responsible for governing the fly sleep-wake program. So flies are active in the morning, they're active in the evening, and, and they take a siesta in the middle of the day. They're not stupid. Um, they take a nap about just about this time of day. And, and, uh, <coughs> and, they, and they sleep at night, and, and there are specific circadian cells which drive those particular parts of the program. So this, this small circuit um, is of interest to us as a small neuronal circuit and how it responds to input and, and how it drives output, you know, for instance, sleep and locomotion. And I'm going to just say that we've spent a lot of time on single cell sequencing, um, these 75 cells, and we can, I can discuss this in more detail if anybody's interested. But the, but the I'm going to, let me, let me just get to this because I think this is the point I wanted to, where's the goal here? Let me see, did I skip it? Okay, so this is, the, this, this is, I'm not going to show any of this stuff, but I'm going to end with this uh, goal, let's just say. So I think, I think from a neuroscience sleep perspective, I think if you could uh, assay the 100,000 neurons of the fly brain <coughs> as a function of behavioral state and get a very good imprint, get a very good fingerprint of those 100,000 neurons separately, each one, and most importantly, as a function of behavioral state, as we have done for those 75 pairs of neurons as a function of time, of circadian time, you, you might be able to say something about how, where, and why we sleep. Because one would see in the brain which pathways and which neurons at which time were really changing in a way which might reflect or drive rebound sleep, recovery sleep, Sleep might respond to sleep deprivation, et cetera. So I think the, the goal of single cell seek, that is characterizing each neuron in the brain, and I think the, the dream is to do this in a, in a behaviorally relevant way where you could see this uh, and, and correlate it with the actual behavior the animal was doing would tell us something important about sleep and, and, and its brain control you know, bidirectionally, you know, how does sleep impact the brain and how does the brain impact sleep? And I think given how long I've gone, I'm going to stop. Thank you all very much.